This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We will get started in just a few minutes. Welcome to the program today. We've got a great, great um, program this afternoon. We're going to be talking about health equity, closing the gap of care inequality for vulnerable individuals and their communities. I'm Jen Kovich Bordnick, CEO of Executives for Health Innovation. Welcome. Um, tell us where you're logging in from. If you want to jump into the chat box and give us a sense of where around the country you are, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> I'm here just outside of Washington, D.C. It's beautiful and sunny today. Uh, Mike, where are you logging in from? Uh, right outside of D.C. in the Columbia, Maryland area. Beautiful. Any other Maryland folks? We've got Michigan here, Nebraska, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, Buffalo, New York. Oklahoma City. Okay, wow. All across the nation here. Uh, let us know how much snow you've gotten so far as well. <laughs> I understand there's a lot of snow happening right now around the country, not here in Washington, but um, everywhere else. Kevin, where are you logging in from? I am also from suburban DC in Prince George's County, Maryland. Fantastic. Joseph, where are you today? Are you in DC as well? I'm here in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, here at Mass General Hospital today, my clinical office. Great. Um, Lauren, how about you? Where are you? I am in uh, outside of Boston. I was just typing in. We have about three or four inches of snow. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I see a lot of folks joining us today do not have snow, so lucky for you guys. Uh, Newton, there's one of your neighbors, Joseph, so a couple of your folks from your way. Welcome, everybody. We've got a wonderful program for you. We're going to just give folks a couple of minutes to log on today to join us. Um, we have a fantastic group here today from the CDC Foundation, from Optum, <clears throat> excuse me, Commonwealth Fund. We're really fortunate to have these incredible speakers with us here today. Right. Welcome, San Diego. Good to see you. Snowy Washington State. So glad that you were able to join us today. Welcome, everybody. All right. I want to see if we have any of our international folks as well. We usually have a few folks um, from the Middle East um, or um, India logging in. So let's see if we have any. Um, international uh, folks with us here today as well. I'd love to hear from you. A lot of Boston folks, which is certainly um, good for you, Joseph. So, um, all right, I've got a couple of introductory remarks, which I'm gonna go through quickly before I turn this program over. So Emma, why don't we get started on this? Emma, here with me, my partner in crime. We'll get started Hello. here. Great. <laughs> all right. So again, we're going to be talking about closing the gap of care and equality for vulnerable individuals and their communities. I'm Jen Kovach-Bordnick, the CEO of Executives for Health Innovation, EHI, and we're really excited to be bringing this new thought leadership series to you on health equity. Next slide. And we're very fortunate today that if you are looking for CEUs, continuing education credits, you can get them. Um, there are, you can see here, there's a list of different um, organizations that are giving away CEUs for this program today. And if this is something that you are interested in, go ahead and take a snapshot of that. We'll also be sending it out to you through email um, and through the chat. We'll give you the link as well. So please take advantage of that. It's a great opportunity for everybody. Next slide. For those of you who are not familiar with EHI, EHI has been around for about two decades. Um, we are a small nonprofit in Washington, D.C., a catalyst for healthcare transformation. And what we do is bring together diverse leaders from all across the industry to figure out how can we do some collaborative innovation. Our members are working on a number of core issues. Go ahead to the next slide here. So what do we do? We do collaborative learning. We do, uh, if you go back there, Em, <laughs> shaping policy and thought leadership. We've got all kinds of roundtables and online sessions like this one here today. Um, a number of reports coming out as well. Um, we do a lot of work on Capitol Hill with policymakers, helping them educate them on different issues and understand we're a great resource to them on Capitol Hill. And we also crank out a lot of thought leadership pieces using our networking uh, platform. And we have a great group of different folks. I'll show you that in just a moment here. Next slide. 
So the core issues that we work on at EHI are patient experience, health equity and access, digital care and privacy and cybersecurity. And if you go to our website, ehidc.org, you'll see a number of reports and educational programs all around um, these four core areas. We've got 20 years of work and experience. Um, we'd love to you to share your work as well. So if this is an area that you work in, please let us know. Next slide. And this is just a sampling of some of the executives that we work with and different organizations that we work with. Um, you can see there's really a broad um, group here, everybody from um, Google to United to IQVIA to Verado, um, labs, um, pharmacies, everybody's kind of in this group. Um, so if you do not see the name of your organization up there and you'd like to join us, go ahead and just send me a chat through the chat box here. I'd be happy to get back to you. A couple of upcoming events to make you aware of. We have a great program tomorrow. We're gonna to be talking about cancer care with clinical pathways. Love to have you join us for that program as well. Um, as the second part of this health equity series, we're going to be doing a program in April. We'll be announcing that date shortly on avoiding unintended bias, um, AI and machine learning to address health disparities. Um, so we will get that data out to you soon and hopefully you'll come back for that and a number of different resources for you to log on and grab there. We've got a great blog um, right now on health equity. So take a look at that. And finally, a big thank you to United Health Group. Really grateful for their support of this program. We are a very small nonprofit and we would not be able to deliver programs like this without their generous support and others. So thank you. All right, now I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Kevin Larson, who's going to take us through the rest of the program today. <clears throat> um, a lot of you know Kevin as the Senior VP of Clinical Innovation at Optum, but uh, prior to doing all of those exciting things, he actually had an incredible career um, in public health um, and working um, in Minnesota. He actually was at Medicaid and Medicare Services, um, CMS as we all know it, for a number of years, leading on transformation before he even showed up in DC, um, he was out at Minnesota Hennepin Medical Center, uh, the Center for Urban Health, working on healthcare financing, health literacy, and health disparities for a number of years. So really an expert in this um, area and delighted that he's going to take us through the program today. So I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, who will introduce the rest of our panelists today. And um, Kevin, you on board? Thank you, Jen. Happy to be here. It's really exciting and what a terrific group of uh, panelists we have. So first we have uh, Dr. Joe Betancourt, who is the president of the Commonwealth Fund. Um, next, we have Mike Curry, a colleague of mine at United Health Group and the senior vice president and chief health equity officer. And um, finally, we have Dr. Lauren Smith, who's the chief health equity and strategy officer at the CDC Foundation. Uh, a fellow uh, HHS uh, person from, from my past. So great to see you all and really happy to have this um, session. Um, what we'll do is start with each of them giving a brief overview about the health equity program in their organization institution. But we all agreed a conversation is a lot more fun than listening to a series of, of um, a PowerPoint presentation. So we'll have some of these brief overviews and then we'll go into a Q&A. I'll start with some moderator questions, but then we would love to uh, welcome some questions from uh, the participants as well. So with that, I will um, invite Dr. Betancourt to tell us a little bit about the work at the Commonwealth Fund. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be with you here and certainly to be with my friends, uh, Michael and Lauren, uh, you know, individuals who have uh, I've had the pleasure of working with over many, many years, and, and I think I uh, share a real dedication, passion, and commitment to our conversation uh, today uh, with them. And uh, we really look forward to this conversation with you all and, and uh, hope the conversation will be driven by your questions and we can take it in a variety of different directions. So Kevin, I thought by I'd begin by talking a bit about where I am now, I've only been there since January 17th, and then talk a bit about some of the work that I've done in my past, particularly focused on health equity. Uh, and then I'll turn it over uh, to Lauren and Michael. So um, as mentioned, I'm president of the Commonwealth Fund. The Commonwealth Fund is a national healthcare foundation established in 1918. Really, the goal of the Commonwealth Fund as a think and do tank is to promote a high performing, uh, equitable healthcare system that achieves better access, improved quality and efficiency 
uh, for society in general, but particularly for society's most vulnerable. It's an honor and a privilege to have uh, assumed this position uh, in January. And we have a very robust uh, advancing health equity program led by Dr. Lori Zeffrin uh, and a team of individuals who really focus on health equity in three different buckets. One, uh, really focusing on organizations uh, to develop rigor around um, structural equity and anti-racism across all of their portfolio programs. Second, a bucket of work that focuses on federal and state policymakers looking at uh, policies related to racial equity, with a particular focus on uh, maternal health and black uh, infant mortality. And then finally, uh, really trying to share promising interventions across the uh, uh, healthcare industry on efforts that are, you know, again, successful in identifying and addressing disparities. As I mentioned, I just began in this role and uh, we are uh, doing a lot in this space, uh, but I'll say, a lot of my work in health equity comes prior to my uh, role at the Commonwealth Fund. So I'm here now coming from my clinical office at Mass General Hospital, where I've been a practicing primary care doctor for about 22 years and also have had several roles. One, directing our Disparity Solution Center, where we have worked with hospitals, health plans, uh, health centers across the nation through our Disparities Leadership Program, now upwards of 400 across 35 states, really focusing on the basics of better identifying and addressing disparities and achieving equity, including uh, creating organizational buy-in, uh, creating uh, data collection strategies, performance measurement, interventions, evolving to be the vice president for equity and inclusion, where we um, launched something called our structural equity 10-point plan, a very robust effort uh, to better identify and address disparities and achieve equity here at Mass General, and then helping launch uh, as the senior vice president for equity and community health, are united against racism effort across Mass General Brigham as part of a large team who architected that and was executing that. So I left all that work uh, behind except for my clinical work now as of January. And so suffice it to say that I care deeply about this work. I broaden my portfolio now with the Commonwealth Fund, but really excited uh, to talk about what we've accomplished in partnership with many organizations, including here at Mass General uh, over the years. And so I appreciate the opportunity, Kevin. That's terrific. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Smith, well, I'd love to hear about what you're doing at the CDC Foundation. Happy to. And of course, you know, Joe is a very hard act to follow, um, <laughs> but uh, I'll do my best. So I am the Chief Health Equity and Strategy Officer at the CDC Foundation. Um, my background is as a pediatrician and a former public health official for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I was medical director and then interim commissioner there. So like Joe, I've been deeply involved from my clinical work at Boston Medical Center to now um, to working on equity across many dimensions, including how it affects uh, child health and family health and well-being. But our goal at the CDC Foundation, which is a nonprofit entity that was developed to promote public health uh, more broad, more generally, but CDC specifically, our health equity goal is to achieve healthy, thriving, resilient communities. And, you know, we believe health equity, as I think, you know, Michael and Joe would agree, is when everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health and well-being. And we know that that means overcoming structural and uh, systemic challenges to be able to do that. So the foundation has six strategies for impact. I'll just briefly mention them. Um, one is to strengthen the public health system. We know that it is undergoing currently a uh, significant assault. I think it's not overstating it to say that in terms of um, an a, a, desires by many to sort of defund, underfund, and otherwise restrict public health. Um, we want to address uh, climate and health, the challenges that we're seeing all the time related to this and worsening, um, especially in communities of color who often bear the brunt of uh, climate and environmental um, issues. The third is to promote and protect the public's health through communication. We know how important um, uh, skilled and uh, strategic communication is to address mis- and disinformation. To modernize, the fourth is to modernize public health protection data, that's you know, data modernization. The fifth is to fortify global health security to protect the US from health threats. And the last but not least is 
where what I'm leading, which is to integrate health equity principles into all of our work, both internally and externally. We engage in domestic and global product projects with partners all across um, the US and across the globe, and especially over the pandemic, we really deepen the connection with communities and community-based organizations, um, partnering with and funding more than 300 uh, community-based organizations that were um, all uh, aligned to address uh, disparities in, in, uh, in the pandemic. So I'll just leave it there. The last thing I would say is that we do have, um, and I'm hoping we'll get to talk about some of the key principles that we're trying to sort of incorporate into our, our work. And I'd love to share some of those with you. Wonderful, I can't wait to hear about them. Um, and last but not least, my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, uh, Michael Curry from uh, United Healthcare. Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're situated. Um, Kevin mentioned, I have the real uh, proud uh, honor uh, and pleasure of being the Chief Health Equity Officer here at United Health Group. We've had at, here at United Health Group, we've had close to two decades of, uh, of work in this space of health equity, um, really picking up momentum and increasing the work that we do over the years and months that we've been leaning into this work across our full enterprise and across our lines of business. This work really mirrors and uh, lays alongside of our overall mission to help people live healthier lives and help the health system work better for everyone. So when you talk about this work associated with health equity, to enable and deliver equitable care for all that we serve, you can hear how it really mirrors and aligns with our overall mission of the organization. Our focus now over the past uh, couple of years is to take all of the lessons learned over the years, all of the efforts, close to 400 some odd efforts that we've had underway across the organization, learn from them, scale them further and accelerate them so that we can do more. And then we can, as we prioritize more work, uh, we can bring resources to bear to not only do more, but accelerate the work that's underway. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation we'll have today. Great. Um, so EHI, as it says in its name, is around executives. So I'm going to start with a question about how did you engage your executives in this health equity conversation? And uh, many of us have worked in organizations where the executives change uh, fairly frequently. So it's not just about having one executive sponsor, but building a sustaining approach with your executive team. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. So um, Lauren, would you like to kick us off? I never want to get in front of Lauren, um, or I'm happy to start us off. Oh, you're on mute, Lauren. Go ahead, Mike. All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, so uh, this is, uh, my, the answer to this question is really follow up to what I just mentioned in the introduction, um, where our organization is rooted in doing what we can for not only the members that we serve, but benefiting the overall healthcare system. So this work in this lens of health equity is really uh, an organization or enterprise imperative. What we do, how we prioritize the work, how we embed the work in what we do. I will, Kevin, you've heard me say before, my overall goal as the months continue and the years continue is to have this work so deeply embedded into all that we do, it is, just becomes how we do what we do. It's not really something that we need to focus on or have a specific leader like myself focused on. It's just ingrained in what we do. There's so much work to do. Any which way you turn, you will find disparities uh, in, in inequities that need attention. So determining a prioritization uh, and what you're going to focus on and when you're going to focus on it, how many resources, how many kinds of resources that are going to be devoted to it, that's really the hard part of the job. There's no shortage of work 
to be done, trying to figure out where you're going to focus and when you're going to focus, knowing that the other 56 things that didn't line up in the top five are just, just as worthy or um, have similar worthiness to focus as the top five. So th this work that we do here at United, in summary, before I turn it over to Lauren and Joe, the work that we do here at United, it directly aligns with the mission. So it's not a hard sell. There's no pitch associated with trying to get this work moved along. It really all is about um, the value proposition for the members that we serve. And uh, especially if we're looking at doing something that has community benefit and prioritizing amongst all the things that we could do, what we're going to focus on, where we're going to focus on it, and how aggressively we're going to go after it. Mike, I, if I could just sort of, you know, pull on a couple of the threads that that you 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 mentioned. One is that you said your this equity work or health equity work is aligned with the intrinsic mission of the organization. So it's not a nice to have, but it is a must have or a, a strategic imperative. And I think that's really, um, you know, if we could sort of underscore, you know, and circle that a couple times. I think, I think sometimes though it can take some effort to, to demonstrate or to show that in fact, the strategic imperative of the overall organization is in fact aligned with and requires the achievement of health equity. And it can sometimes take you know, some energy and effort to, to ensure that people understand that in a deep way so that it doesn't feel like a, you know, um, a fad or you know a a response to you know the um the uprisings and outpouring of you know energy around um uh black lives matter or the you know the spate of police you know um uh related homicides that you know we saw in 2020 so i guess i would just say that although it's it's an imperative to do it sometimes it can take a, a series of conversations, a, a journey um, to be able to um, to allow to allow an organization to reckon with one of the principles we talk about is reckoning with both current and historic, you know, structural racism and systemic biases. And institutions and organizations often, you know, have a um, what's the right way of saying it, sort of a momentum that they don't want to shift. Mm -hmm. uh, because, and it can be hard to acknowledge some of those things. So it's necessary, but can be, you know, requires certainly significant energy and effort. Dr. Bedencourt, you build a whole program about this. What? what yeah, are you, yeah. So, you know, I, I'd say a couple of things. So first, you know, executive leadership around this work is essential. I also want to define this work because I think people right now, sadly, hear health equity uh, and these sets of terms have become highly politicized. And that's unfortunate. Uh, and what we know is if we dial it back and really focus on leaders and executives as really managing what they measure, what we understand is this concept of disparities, differences in health outcomes by race and ethnicity among many characteristics, but our conversation around is around race and ethnicity today um, is part of our national fabric. And as Lauren has mentioned, this is historic in nature. This didn't happen by coincidence or by chance. Um, that being said, uh, we do know that if we look at our nation's largest killers, minorities tend to die at greater rates for almost all of them. And when we compare ourselves to other nations, we tend to do less well in things like infant mortality, uh, you know, despite much larger investments, particularly for women of color. What we also understand is that those disparities, those differences are in part due to the social influencers of health, social determinants, the types of things that have ga gathered a lot of attention and that we in public health have focused on a long, a long, for a long time. Certainly issues related to access and, and having insurance and being able to use it in a meaningful way. And then finally, uh, you know, data that very clearly demonstrates that two people could present to the healthcare system, all things being equal about them except for the color of their skin, and they have a chance of receiving unequal treatment, different treatment with minorities receiving lower quality care than their white counterparts. So I think you know, for, for the better part of 20 years in our work, and I'll use my example in the hospital space, what we've had to do is engage executives um, with this evidence um, to, to some degree in a dispassionate way to say, we're gonna look at the data, this is our commitment, this is our mission, um, and we're gonna look at this data 
and we are going to have the courage to interrogate that data, get the data that we need, and really have also the courage to monitor our performance and see where we're falling short and develop interventions to address them. That has required a lot of change management, uh, a lot of kind of bringing people along. You know, executives have a lot on their desk. What we want to do is try to make them understand that health equity shouldn't be bolted on, but it's built in. It's connected to cost, quality, safety, value, and there is a cost to uh, inaction and inequity. Uh, and so that narrative over the years, I think, uh, we've been able to create progress initially among early adopters who really understood the social uh, justice component of this, but also understood the business case. And then, you know, uh, people like Michael and, and Lauren and, and myself and others have been making the business case as an adjunct to the social justice case to say, you know, this isn't just, as Lauren said, you know, a nice thing to do. This is the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. And, you know, as we, if we care about quality, if we care about value, if we care about bending the cost curve, we need to be attentive to health equity. And the types of issues that lead to disparities don't just impact people of color, they impact people of all stripes, but ultimately disproportionately impact people of color. So our, our efforts really aim to improve quality for all and achieve equity uh, across the board. And Joe, if I, I mean, I just wanna, you know, multiple claps to that, that last piece there because <laughs> Part of what I think we have found in our over the arcs of our career and having these conversations is that making or having the moral argument or the social justice argument can sway some folks and can make some headway. But this idea that health inequities don't only harm the people who experience them directly, but that by by sapping our collective potential for productivity, for creation and innovation for tax paying, for, you know, work product, you know, all of those things, that ends up having a, an impact on everyone, including the people who don't actually suffer the, the inequities or the disparities themselves. And I think that to your point, that business case of, you know, it's not a smart or strategic thing to do to relegate a significant, and I, you know, as we all know, an increasing proportion of our population to preventable health inequities when we need folks, you know, not on the sidelines, but, you know, in the game, so. And Kevin, can I just take a moment? You know, I, I saw a okay. chat here um, from Stephen Thomas. I think I want to begin by acknowledging leaders like, like him who shoulders we stand on. I certainly stand on the shoulders of people like Michael Byrd, people like Jack Geiger, uh, and a whole series of others. And I think, you know, humbly, we come here to carry that torch forward. Uh, Dr. Thomas examples around, you know, the incredible work that he's done over the years are just, you know, some of, of uh, an incredible, I think, patchwork of work that's been done over the years that gives us an opportunity to kind of advance this agenda further. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I'm honored that, that we have, number one, so many people on, but Number two, it seems, you know, some of the people who, who have really done groundbreaking work in this space. Yeah, yeah agreed. It's it's very um, inspirational, the, the participation. Um, so, you know, taking Dr. Thomas's example, we have lots of bright spot examples of places that have figured things out, the Chicago Barbershop um, hypertension program, many of these. How do you think about bringing those things to scale? You know, part of what we're all interested in here is is scaling and not having just one or two places where we've improved health equity, but we really make it an improvement uh, across the board. So, love to hear your thoughts about scaling. I'll, I'll jump back in. So, the, there are two words that begin with S. Um, scale is one of them. Uh, the other is sustainability. And when we're thinking about this, it goes into this whole notion of prioritization. The first and foremost, as Joe has mentioned, you can't manage what you don't measure. So you, the first priority is to identify, it's really what I call the big four. What disparities exist, where they exist, what population or populations are most impacted and what the order of magnitude of the disparity is. And that sort of formulates your prioritization strategy. So as you look across, as Joe mentioned, any health measure you want to look at and identify disparities, you put it through this prioritization 
matrix or lens to determine what rises to the top, where you're going to focus, if there is uh, any sort of customer demand associated with it, if there's some sort of regulatory demand associated with it, put all of that together to decide what you're going to do. Then the focus on doing the work, scaling the work and making it sustainable, what we have found is really two things. Number one, it absolutely requires a, a commitment of time and resources. There is no shortcut around that. It absolutely requires a commitment of time and resources because when we're talking about addressing health inequities or health disparities, as we all know, these are not things that you solve in a quarter or 12 months, many times not 24 months. These are long-term investments and commitments. So uh, there has to be that understanding going in. That's number one. And number two, uh, let's just use United Health Group as the example. We're a large organization, but there's no way that United Health Group by ourselves can address the multitude of inequities that contribute to the health disparities that we see. So then it becomes imperative and incumbent upon us to establish partnerships, national partnerships and local partnerships to execute on whatever it is we've decided to execute on to bring it that second S, Kevin, and that sustainability. What we don't wanna do is have something that runs for the course of a contract or some period of time that then just sort of evaporates mm. and goes away. What you wanna do is build it for scale and sustainability. And it's for, for us, it's that commitment of resources and that commitment to partnerships that really gives it a different kind of stickiness. Well, I, I guess I would just sort of, again, sort of underscore, I think that the multi-sector collaboration piece is essential, not only because, you know, there's there's not enough resources in, in you know, the healthcare sector or the philanthropic sector, um, um, all of the, the holdings of the Commonwealth Fund and other foundations notwithstanding, right? There's not enough resources there to do the kind of systems level change that has to happen. So you really do have to draw on full away the business sector, the commercial sector, the philanthropic sector, as well as the public sector. So totally agree. So Dr. Bettencourt mentioned that um, at times uh, the, the not every part of the country or not every um, political environment is friendly yeah. to diversity um, and inclusion. So all of you are working in national organizations that work in multiple different um, states, multiple different um, environments. How are you thinking about a national program um, that has to account for this difference in um, receptiveness to diversity uh, and inclusion? Kevin, I, maybe I'll begin by saying, you know, we have had a chance in my previous work at the Disparity Solutions Center to work with, again, over 400 organizations in 35 states. And I think that has been an incredible opportunity to teach and learn. And what you learn very quickly is that this work advances at different paces in different places, certainly in large part dependent on local politics and local policy. And so the tactics, although the playbook, I would argue, remains the same, the messaging, what evidence you lead with, um, how you package what you're trying to uh, accomplish might shift and change. And we should have no, no kind of shame in that, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I would say that you know, I've had the, the great privilege of working uh, with partners in places that you might think, no way, no how, nothing could get done there because of the politics. And, and let's just be clear, at an extreme, you might say a, you know, in the South or a deep red state, you know, where generalizing there might be more kind of concern around this, particularly now is where we're more polarized. And I think some of our biggest successes have been working in places like that um, where through partnerships and, and messaging this correctly, we've seen some, some great accomplishments. I, I saw one of my colleagues, Juana Slade, chat in, um, you know, from uh, Carolina, South Carolina, uh, and MedHealth. I mean, we worked together what, maybe two decades ago at a very early time. And this was a leader who was able to shape this, engage her leadership, 
Um, we've worked with the South Carolina Hospital Association, done some incredible work. So I would say that we shouldn't um, uh, be intimidated by, by this idea that the politics or the policy may line up. There are successes to be had everywhere here and every step forward is progress. Uh, and I think we have ample examples of that. And even people here who, who've been successful in places that, again, you might stereotype as uh, that it's not going to be a place that's friendly to diversity or friendly to, you know, health equity and the like. And so, you know, there, there, there's no one solution, no one suspect. And a lot, but a lot of people who move this work forward in very tactical ways. And I'll end by saying that this really needs to move. This work has been kind of heavy on aspiration, light on execution. And the, the light on execution, uh, I think, has been an Achilles heel because we've advanced work in so many ways by doing what? Setting goals, timelines, milestones, uh, accountability, resources, transparency. That same execution rigor has not been applied to health equity, and it is desperately needed. And that's what we've actually seen over the last couple of years. And to get to the sustainability piece, I mean, we've seen a drip, drip, drip of progress by early adopters certain places. Um, that being said, uh, you know, you having been in CMS, you know what CMS is doing now around equity. We know what payers are doing around equity, you know, pay for equity and the like. So we've also been light on regulation and healthcare financing to really move this to a need to do. Mm -hmm. And we are getting there now. And I would encourage everyone who's still hesitant to get on board, you know, because this is going to be forced on you if you don't kind of think about it strategically and, and be proactive. If I could, you know, add to what Joe was saying, you know, perhaps in a, in a parallel lane is this idea about, about communication. One of the things that I mentioned was, you know, um, an awareness of how and the, the approaches to communication that take into account the, the narratives of polarization and the mindset reinforcing narratives that Joseph Joe was alluding to that you know you might say are are concentrated in certain areas, but are are really sort of prevalent or exist in every everywhere. But understanding how you know there's a science and art to understanding and how you frame arguments, how you, you know, what what language do you use that allows people to even hear what you're talking about or to enter into uh, the conversation without sort of um, invoking things that are, you know, less productive or less helpful. So, you know, I would say in the same way that we haven't been as rigorous in some of the areas that Joe was talking about, I don't know that we have been as rigorous as we can be um, and should be around the the communications piece. And we saw so, so intensely how Others who are focusing on mis and disinformation are really quite adept and highly skilled at leveraging um, those principles to their kind of, you know, obviously less productive and helpful ends. So I think we have a, a, a way that we, we need to get much more sophisticated and nuanced in that piece for us. You know, Kevin, just a layer, and Joe mentioned, or, or I'm sorry, there was in the chat, um, a question about examples, mm -hmm. um, because this theoretically, this all sounds great. I'm sure everyone mm -hmm. sitting on the call is in a virtual head nod um, uh, based on everything that's being heard. So I'll just get from a payer perspective, I'll give you three examples of what this looks like. So when we talk about partnerships, we have this um, United Healthcare Catalyst Program, the, regardless of what we call it. It's all about developing the partnership. So we have both national and local partnerships with housing um, agencies, as well as other community-based organizations to address social factors or social determinants of health within a community so that we can help individuals within that community uh, um, do their best to achieve optimal health. That's one example. Number two is when we look at benefit design as a payer and the benefits that we offer. Uh, Kevin, as you know, we removed copay and coinsurance for something like insulin um, for those who have diabetes. That removes a barrier and reduces disparities. A last example that I would share would be in-home visits and how we're leveraging in-home visits specifically uh, in large part in our Medicare and retirement business. That has an impact, as Joe has mentioned, yes, on patient quality, 
but it also addresses access and health disparities. So the, just a few examples for uh, those in attendance to chew on and think about when you think about what a payer could do, maybe in partnership with you, but when you think about what you could do, whatever your respective organization is, I offer you those uh, examples. So uh, uh, maybe a related question here from the chat. Um, what are the efforts that you do to educate on the, the to fight the disinformation around health uh, inequity? Um, so that the, this disinformation is something that, that has, um, as Lauren has mentioned, um, uh, often had a stronger signal, or at least we, we hear about it more often than we hear about the, the signal around uh, inequities. Any of you know Lauren, of any disinformation fighting campaigns? Well, I would say that there's been um, tremendous partnerships that have specifically uh, addressed this. One is around, uh, you may have seen the conversation. Um, that's a, a set of um, Latino and Black healthcare providers who are specifically in bite-sized chunks taking on mis- and disinformation and um, addressing it um, in collaboration with the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation, just a Black coalition against COVID. There, there is a number of organizations that were particularly focused on this communication piece. So I think people recognize that I but to your point, Kevin, I think that the amplification through social media of the mis and disinformation is so strong that it's, you know, takes really concerted effort to try to, to, you know, combat that. Yeah, and I, I know FDA and others have been taking on uh, misinformation broadly as a, as a strategic priority, actually. Um, uh, so, Lauren, you were talking about principles. So you you said that that um, you have some principles that you follow. Maybe you could uh, tell us some of those principles, and we could hear from others what what the principles they're using to uh, advance equity. Sure, I'd be happy to. And I think that we've started to talk about several of these already. So, and and Steve, uh, Dr. Thomas in the chat has been really you know um, emphasizing this. The first is around authentic, meaningful you know, bi-directional community partnerships. So engaging with the community in a way that's not extractive, it's not um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, just, just for convenience, you know, come when you need something, but then, you know, you disappear. So, you know, being able to engage in the kind of community partnerships that people are really sort of looking for. So that's that's one. The other um, is is around focusing on changing systems at the, you know, so we have programs and we have, you know, policies, but we need to sort of go deeper in terms of what are the structural changes that that need to change. I think, you know, both Mike and Joe referred to the fact that those, you know, those systems and structures have led us to where we are. And so we have to sort of really dismantle and sort of, you know, go at that level. So that's another piece. We talked about cross-sector collaboration already, that that's required because, you know, unfortunately, pu um, public health and healthcare aren't in control of the domains where a lot of health happens, education, housing, transportation, you know, economic development. So we have to have partnerships that include um, those groups. And then the last, um, and I, I know both uh, Mike and Joe would agree with this, is around applying the lessons that you're learning, sort of being in a learning mindset so that you can take what you're learning and apply and and be willing to change and modify and um, you know not be wedded to something if it's not working. And that's certainly a, a, a real principle around you know healthcare, health improvement. So you know, healthcare has adopted that approach. Very cool. Um, so you'd talked about community partnerships. Yeah. If, if uh, one of our members or one of the participants here is an organization that wants to start with community partnerships, how do they do that? How do you, how do you engage in that community partnership that you haven't engaged in before? And how do you build that bi-directional relationship? Well, I have some ideas, but I don't, I, I, you know, I know Joe and Mike have ideas too. Well, you know, first place to start is, you know, where, you know, to reach out into the community and find out, you know, who is, who's, who, who's caring about and who's already working on these, these kinds of issues. 
many organizations um, will know some of this because they've had to do the community health needs assessments or some other structured landscape, you know, uh, or environmental assessment of, you know, what who's doing work in this realm. Part of the issue, though, can be that some of the more resourced and well-connected organizations are the ones that might get found or get identified, where some of the more grassroots ones, you know, maybe heads down doing the work, but, you know, not, don't, doesn't have the infrastructure to um, amplify their mm -hmm. work. So it requires, you know, connecting with folks who have those networks to be able to, to really identify that. Maybe, maybe Dr. Bagancourt, do you have examples of a great community partnership and all the Yeah, work? you know, Kevin, I just begin, I begin by saying that, you know, community-based organizations have been approached by umpteen amount of people wanting to partner. You need to start there. You need to understand that, that there's a great likelihood that, you know, hi there, I want to partner with you mm -hmm. um, is going to land a certain way. Mm -hmm. right? And so it, it's really understanding with humility that, um, if you want to engage in a community partnership, it is starting with humility. It's going there and saying, look, I want to learn about you. I know people have been here and talked about this before. Mm -hmm. I know people have done research with you and taken it and not shared it with you. Mm -hmm. I know people have leveraged you for grants. I know people have built you into accountable care organizations and you've got no resources. I know people are putting you on lists so that you could help with the social determinants and not adding any resources to your capacity. I know that. And knowing that, all I'm asking you to do is give me a chance to build to, for you to trust me. And I want to be here. I want to learn. And I want to know how I could be helpful. And you will need to be prepared to put skin in the game to let that organization know that you're for real and that you're in it for the long term. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, skin in the game oftentimes means leading with resources, not leading with kind of goodwill. Uh, because resources are what's most needed in community-based organizations and resources are kind of literally where the rubber hits the road. And I think, you know, uh, when we've built these community partnerships and leading a lot of work around COVID in, in this area, in the Boston area, it's doing exactly that. It's getting to organizations and saying, I want to be a partner here, but you tell me the three ways I could be most effective for what you're trying to achieve. Not, hey, this is what I want to achieve and I want you to help me or I'm going to leverage you to help me. And my People will see through that. So, the, you know, this, is a, this group has been weathered by this process. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand that leading with resources is another, and then beginning with what do you need and how can I help? And it might not be in line with what you want, mm -hmm. but that needs to be where you start because that's how you build trust. And that's how you begin to uh, create an opportunity for true collaboration and compromise. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think those are really essential points there. No, and Kevin, you know that underscores the point I was making earlier about, you know, when you start and all that other good stuff, commitment to resources and partnership. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that I've been taught by wonderful community groups is they have expertise and wisdom and strength. Help me understand how we learn from them, not just how we partner with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that understood, and Joe said it, right? It's humility. It's the, the idea like, you know, I'm, I'm not assuming that I have all the answers. And to your point, Kevin, the wisdom and the the deep learning that can be be shared from folks who have, have the lived experience and can tell you what, what the issues are. I wanted to give just a quick example. I put it in the chat, but the there's a Buffalo Center for Health Equity in Buffalo that in that has is a community rooted in the community. Um, Pastor George runs it, and they have a, a connection with SUNY Buffalo and the Erie County Public Health Department that. I think has really been transformational. And they did a lot of Joe, what you, Joe, and Mike were talking about in terms of the SUNY folks went to where, you know, the Buffalo folks were, you know, they made that, they went with that sense of, we're going to listen first. We're, we're not going to tell you. I mean, all, all of the things that you were, were just talking about, I think were um, identified there and they've, they've gotten to do some really uh, impressive work and have had, um, you know, very good outcome. So that's an example of people want to look. I put it in the chat. That's wonderful. Uh, I just want to add to one thing, Kevin. You know, it was a great point. I think that came in the chat and just kind of seconding what Lauren and Michael are saying is that we need to get away from the deficit model of you know. I said, um, you know, how can we help you? It's mm -hmm. and it also is you know, it's kind of um, 
this idea of, you know, I'm here to help you. It's as, as somebody chatted in, what's going well? How can we amplify that? And what are the assets that you have that we can kind of supercharge, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I, I know you have a lot of needs and I'm here to kind of fill those needs. So mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of balance mindset, you know, that, that asset mindset's really important in these partnerships as well. Totally we, have a question, we have a question here in the chat from Tanya Harris. Um, has your organization begun to employ those actually living within the communities to support and manage the efforts? I think that was directed at me, Kevin. It was directed to you, but I think it's open to anybody. Can, can you read that question again? Sure. Has your organization begun to employ those actually living in these communities to support and manage your efforts? Yeah, it's a good question. And the answer from a United Healthcare perspective is yes. Um, we're broken up into health plans. So when you think about our commercial business and our Medicaid business, it's situated regionally. And absolutely, there is a focus to hire from within the community, uh, especially when you start thinking about our member service representatives, because they're going to understand best what types of issues and realities uh, individuals within the community are facing and bring a kind of cultural sensitivity and awareness and appropriateness to responding um, that we would want all to have, but more, most likely those from within the community have a different sensitivity uh, for. So for our purposes, yes, and I would assume for all payers, uh, hospital systems, um, you, you would get a similar type of response. And Joe, is it, wouldn't that be the same up at uh, Mass General? Yeah, yeah, I think that's accurate. Yeah, no doubt. And there, there are mechanisms to do that specifically. I alluded to it, you know, the for nonprofit healthcare systems and institutions, right? They're the community benefits efforts, which, you know, maybe back in the day were a little bit more perfunctory, but but now really are meant to be linked to community-led and community identified priorities that the hosp the hospital or health system, you know, can then partner with other entities, including local, you know, community foundations, the, you know, the private sector, chamber of commerce, because, you know, they can align it in ways that everyone will see that there's a benefit to doing those sorts of investments. You know, this, Joe knows this example well, in Boston Medical Center, you know, I don't know how many years ago it was, maybe four or five years ago, decided to align all of their community benefits around supportive housing. They just determined that that was something that they, you know, needed to do because it was relevant for their their constituency. Kevin, can I just say one quick thing? I mean, yeah, the status quo has been to make addressing disparities in health equity complicated, right? The, the, that's challenging. That's difficult. This is common sense, really. I mean, nobody on nobody on this line shouldn't be able to analyze a problem mm -hmm. where people are receiving lower quality care, having poor health identify some root causes in their local area, and then think about strategies to address them. I mean, to me, it's it's not, this isn't so advanced that yep. you're only going to get the answers from this webinar or from us, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the challenge to people is to really be good students of their local environment, policies, practices, politics, figure out what are the kind of two or three things that could advance this work. And I think fundamentally, you know, there, there is a graveyard of great interventions that include some of the things that have been chatted in here, community health workers, navigators, um, healthcare coaches, uh, all types of things that just have not been sustained through healthcare financing. That is changing now as we think about this pursuit of value and really kind of thinking about team-based care. And so we have a lot of hope that that, that will you know, kind of uh, bring energy to this. There's a lot more energy around the social influences of health. So, so there, there are a lot of pieces and there's no shortage of opportunities. Here. So I, think I just want to leave everyone with that thought that, that there's no kind of, we're not going to drop some silver bullet here in this conversation. There's a whole myriad of things you could do in your environment to advance this work. No, I've long been a fan of applying the same um, quality improvement principles to inequities uh, as we do to all sorts of other quality gaps. This is a, you know, you have a team, you have people, you know how to do this. You just need to apply that same muscle to this kind of work in, in equity and inequity. So a harder question, racism. Um, racism exists, racism has existed. 
how do we think about racism in this context and what do we do about it? So, um, you're right, that's, uh, I'm not gonna call it a tough question. I'm going to say, um, depending on the audience you're speaking to, uh, it can be interesting to have the conversation about it. But here's what you can't deny. You can't deny that uh, structural racism and bias has existed for decades, undeniable. It still exists in, or the vestiges of it still exist um, in our healthcare delivery system, undeniable. You, we see it in uh, certain algorithms that are old and need to be updated based on old science. You see it in a number of ways. So the only way, and I'll just put this on Mike Curry, the only way that Mike Curry has been able to um, best address this is with the facts and take out any subjectivity and make it objective. So when we talk about clinical algorithms and the improvement necessary because of quality and patient safety, we focus on the facts. We know why it exists, but we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about why it exists. We're gonna focus on the necessary improvements uh, to make it better, make it go away. When we think about air redlining and why we see pockets of poverty and inequity and poor access to care, those of us who've been in this public and population health space for a while, we know why it exists. We don't have to spend a day on why it exists. What we need to focus on is what needs to be done to address it and improvement. Now, we're not going to um, ignore why it exists. We will have acknowledgement of why it exists, but that's not where we spend most of our energy and time. Let's focus on the solutions that address those decades long types of inequities and realities. That's the way I have been at least in some way successful. Here is the reality associated, whether you do it the Mike Curry way or some other way. Here's the reality. And I know Joe, Joe and I have talked before and I'm sure Lauren would agree as well. The reality is we can never do it fast enough. Those of us who have been doing this work, you can never do it fast enough. You can never bring enough resources to address everything you see. But in summary, you acknowledge why and you move towards the solutions um, that hopefully best address it with sustainability in mind. I'd also say, Kevin, you know, in, in the early years of this work, um, the reason we were, you know, so, you know, going back 15, 20 years, we would talk about racism, but, you know, the big pushback was, well, racism doesn't exist. We're past that. And boy, in this day and age, you know, it's completely paradoxical. I mean, if, if people don't see how blatant racism is nowadays, I mean, it is it is just, you know, the argument that we used to need to be cautious around it, you know, it, it has been animated in ways, at least like I've never seen in my lifetime, certainly uh, in the last three to five years, um, and maybe a little bit more. And so ultimately, you know, this when we were going through this work in 2020, like many organizations were really doubling down, finally getting more real around this. You know, I remember people saying, you know, this work, uh, the resistance is like a chameleon. It will adjust, it will twist, it will push, it will turn. And, um, and change is hard and people don't want to change. So they're going to brush back and saying, you're pushing too bad. You, you know, you're pushing too far and you're woke. And they're going to weaponize this whole kind of next chapter of advancing kind of this, this part in history. And that's the reality that, that we're living. And ultimately, I think we need to be very clear-throated about our history and that data, but be very clear-throated about, you know, the reality of what these outcomes lead to, what, what the quality, the safety, the value costs is. I think those two things could go in parallel. And this isn't about, you know, pointing fingers. It's about getting to a better place. And I end by saying, you know, many of us are, are, have heard the adage, you know, it's not about... It might be impossible to change hearts and minds, but, but you can change policies and practices and behaviors and hold people accountable for that. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, this next chapter is one which 
again, reiterates that. I mean, look, you know, we see the resistance out there and, and, and we have to package this in certain ways, but ultimately our goal is to change policies, practices, accountability, you know, financing mechanisms, um, uh, accreditation standards, you know, and, and I think that will at least move this, this chapter that we're, we're trying to lead forward in, in some way until, you know, the, the next group comes and, and, and takes that torch. And I'll say that next group is coming strong. Uh, you know, this next group of leaders is inspiring and, and they are, um, you know, they give a lot of us incredible hope uh, because there is incredible energy. You know, the, the younger generations are like, you know, we're here to fix this and we're going to fix it. Um, and we're not going to accept that's just because that's the way it's been. So, you know, just a couple of other observations. Eloquently said. Um, uh, so in closing, you know, maybe I'll reach out to each of you to have a couple of closing comments. Um, Dr. Smith, maybe we'll start with you. Oh, that's no fair. Um, <laughs> you know, just, you know, everything Mike and Joe said, Michael and Joe said, I, I guess I would want to leave on the note of uh, hope and inspiration that I think Joe was starting to take is to not be um, weighed down by the uh, level of challenge that we are facing. And it does feel like it's unprecedented or or at least intensified in the back, backlash or response to the pandemic, but to know that there are um, key levers that we can pull, and, and he mentioned some of them, and I would just add to the, the, the ones that he mentioned, recognizing those power dynamics and the importance of relationships and the undermining, under, under um, uh, the under points of, narrative and mindsets that end up generating those other pieces. Wonderful. M Mike? Yeah, simply put, for all listening and for all who have influence in your respective organizations, if not now, when? If not you, who? Be a change agent. Joe? Yeah, same. I mean, every step forward is a step forward. You know, we're the stewards of this day and age. We advance this work in any way we can. And again, I think um, if everybody takes one step forward, that's momentum. And that's what we've been after. And uh, we ask people to have the courage to do that and to be strategic in how they do it. And we thank everyone for taking time out, uh, certainly for listening and engaging in this conversation. Thank you all. This was fantastic. Also want to call out the chat is filled with wonderful resources. So people want to learn more, look at the chat and you'll find resources. Um, thank you very much on behalf of EHI and uh, please join us for our next thank webinar. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank well. you for inviting me. Thank you.